Father, thank you so much for giving us your Son, for redeeming us from the clutches of sin and death. Oh Lord, and we await the consummate glory, the redemption of our bodies when we, for all eternity, will be able to sing and to see and behold your face. Lord, thank you for these truths. We thank you for your word. I pray that you would help me now to open it and to exposit it and and preach it truthfully and faithfully. Give us ears to hear and hearts to treasure you and to treasure your Son and your Spirit all the more this morning. Be with us now, I pray in Christ's name. Amen. Well, this morning I have one goal. I want to exalt Christ. My aim is to have you leave this place here this morning valuing, valuing Christ a hundred more times than when you walked in. I want to show you Christ and his glorious accomplishment of redemption in his gospel. I want us to see Christ in his word. I want us to savor Christ. I want us to grab hold of these truths and leave this place this morning beaming with the reality of what Jesus Christ has accomplished on the cross. For some of us, many of us, I trust here, his accomplishment has been applied to us. But for some of us here, it has not yet been applied. And I want you to see exactly what Jesus Christ has done and what he is calling you to partake in, in the gospel of Christ and what he did on the cross. And as you know, for if you've been here for any amount of time, we've been going through the accomplishment of Jesus Christ, what he's accomplished for our salvation. Next week, God willing, we will begin looking at each of these aspects and how they're applied to the believer in time and space to each one of us. You know, if you've been saved, you have what's commonly called a testimony. When did the Lord save you? How did he do it? That's the application of these glorious truths. We've looked at his sacrifice. There needed to be a Godward sacrifice. Death was required for God to, to cover our sins. Something, someone had to pay a price for our sins to be covered. That was the general sacrifice of what Christ did. We looked at his, uh, the propitiation of Christ, how he appeased the wrath. That had the idea of God was holy and just and had to pour out his wrath upon sin. And Jesus Christ, on his work on the cross, fulfilled, he, he satisfied the wrath of God. Last week, we looked at reconciliation, how Jesus Christ brought us back into peaceful relations with God the Father. And this week, we're looking at redemption. Now, redemption is defined as the action of regaining or repossessing something in exchange for a payment or clearing a debt. Something is owed, you redeem it. That means you regain something that was owed. It's the idea of purchase or ransom. The securing of a release by the payment of a price. We all know what a ransom is, right? Here on, we're right here on the Mexico border. And what does the Mexican drug cartel often do? They'll kidnap someone and then demand a ransom price, right? So if you want him back, you've got to pay something to get this person back. That's the idea of redemption or ransom or redeem. So ransom or redemption assumes some kind of imprisonment or captivity or bondage. Therefore, redemption deals with the bondage from which we've been ransomed. So when Christ redeemed us, what does that mean? It means we were in bondage to something, and we'll look at that. We'll look at different aspects of the bondage we were in. And he paid a price to take us back from that bondage. So it's the accomplishment of, of Christ on the cross that deals with our captivity. And we're going to look at three different things, three, three aspects of this bondage and captivity. But before we go into those, I want to make something very clear. I don't want us to pass over a very important reality or fact here. And that's this. Christ paid a price. 
He paid a ransom. Think about, think about it for a moment. It was not a debt or a ransom that he owed. We think, oh, Jesus Christ paid a price. But really stop and think. He didn't owe anything. Look at the, what Scripture testifies about Christ. He upholds the universe by the word of his power. Not one thing came into being that was not made by him, through him, and for him. Who could possibly put Jesus Christ in their debt? Jesus, you owe me. Oh, thank you. Thank you. You paid the price now. Jesus said, oh, I owe you? Here, let me. Jesus paid a price, but Jesus doesn't owe anything. Have you thought about that? He, he upholds the universe. He's above it all. What does he owe anybody? And yet Jesus Christ paid for something when he shed his blood on the cross. His blood was actually the currency with which a debt was satisfied. Turn quickly to Psalm 49. Or you can just listen. Psalm 49. I want to show you something very quickly here. The blood of Jesus Christ was currency which, with which a debt was satisfied. Look at Psalm 49, verse 7. Truly no man can ransom another or give to God the price of his life. For the ransom of their life is costly and can never suffice. That he should live on forever and never see the pit. No man can ransom another or give to God the price of his life. Get this. If you and I were to be saved, if the debt that we owed God was to be paid, no other currency could be accepted but the blood of Jesus Christ. It's our debt. And it's a debt that is impossible for anybody to pay. The price tag that God requires for our redemption to save us from hell is utterly impossible for us to pay. The ransom of their life is costly and can never suffice. Us, fallen man, cannot possibly provide what is needed to secure our lives from eternal damnation. Look at it. Look down in verse 15. Psalm 49, 15. But God will ransom my soul from the power of Sheol, for he will receive me. Selah. You know, Selah is saying, stop a minute, think. No man can pay the ransom price. Not even your life can pay for it. Why is hell eternal? Because you're never ending payment. It's never satisfied. No man can pay the price for your soul. But God, don't read those words too quickly. God will ransom. He will provide the payment of a debt that is utterly impossible for us to pay. God will ransom. And what is that payment? Mark 10, 45. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus Christ's life was given as the God-provided way of rescuing us from the power of sin and the sting of death. Jesus paid with his blood. Get that. He didn't owe anybody anything. We owed God everything. We owed God a debt so great that eternal punishment in hell cannot suffice. And Jesus Christ purchased something with his blood. He actually purchased something. He actually satisfied a debt. The blood of Jesus is precious. And it purchased something for us. And I want to consider then three bondages from which we have been ransomed. 
We're going to look at law, sin, and the body. The bondage of law, the bondage of sin, and the bondage of the physical body. So first, consider with me law. Jesus ransomed us from the captivity to law. All of us are under law. None can escape it. Listen to Paul in Romans chapter 3. Just listen. Chapter 3, 19 and 20. Now we know that whatever the law speaks, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. Did you hear that? The law shuts men's mouths. Why? Well, we could look at Adam and Eve, and we could say, hold on a second, God. You mean to tell me Adam and Eve sinned, and therefore now I'm born into sin? Adam and Eve sinned, and now I'm guilty because of their transgression? Hold on, God. I wouldn't have sinned. You, if you would have told me not to eat of the tree of good and evil, I wouldn't have eaten of it. Why am I being held responsible for them? And you know what God says? Okay. You, want, you have an excuse? You think you've got an excuse that you wouldn't have sinned? Here, keep this. You wouldn't have fallen? Here, keep, this, keep these laws. What happens to your mouth? It's shut. Okay. I guess I would have fallen. I can't, I can't keep that. So that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world accountable to God. You're not guilty. You don't deserve wrath. You would have chosen to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, body, strength. The law of God was given to men to shut their mouths. To leave men without excuse and accountable for their individual actions. You see, the law is like an x-ray machine. Is an x-ray machine bad? No, an x-ray machine's good. But what is it good for? It's good to show you that your leg is broken, right? You go into an x-ray machine and it says, look, this is wrong with you. It's, you, you get to see through your flesh and see the cracked bone. The law exposes us as broken. Paul writes to, to Timothy in 1 Timothy, he says, The law is not laid down for the just, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and sinners, for the unholy and profane, for those who strike their fathers and mothers, for murderers, etc., etc. He goes into a catalog of sin. The law is to demonstrate to men, to expose men as sinners, and it's inescapable by every single natural man. Do you get that? The law shuts our mouths. The law exposes us. All men are under the law. Not one of us can escape from the law and say, I'm not under the law. No, you are under the law. Now turn with me to Galatians 3. We're going to look at a few verses in Galatians chapter 3. <clears throat> I want to show this bondage or this captivity under the law. Galatians chapter 3, starting in verse 10, we'll look at first. Paul writes this, For all who rely on works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. This law that the Lord has given has trapped all men under it. It demands that in order for us to live, we must keep it. Do this and live, don't do this, and you die. The law naturally presses down on us, saying, do me, do me, do me. It demands it of us. You must keep me or else you die. Now continue reading, verse 11. It is evident that no one is justified before God by the law, for the righteous shall live by faith. But the law is not of faith. Rather, the one who does them shall live by them. The one who seeks to keep the law must live by that standard. That's what he's saying. It's written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. All 613 commandments of God, you must do them. If you're going to live under the law, you are obligated to keep every single one. Does that make sense? So we are under the law. Now look down a few verses to, to 23. 
it's, it's just, again, now before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned. In our ransom analogy here, in you think of the drug cartel, having someone hostage and some p price needs to be paid, you know who, who the, the uh, what would you call it, the captor, you know who the captor is here? It's the law. We are held captive under the law. We're imprisoned under it, saying, you must do me if you are to live. And look at this. Jesus Christ, via his work on the cross, has redeemed us. He's paid the ransom price. He's paid the demands of the law to set us free from the law. Look at verse Galatians 3.13. Christ redeemed us. That's our word right there. Redemption, ransom, paid. He paid the price from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree, so that in Christ Jesus the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, so that we might receive the promised Spirit through faith. He redeemed us from this curse. Go to chapter 4 and verse 4. But when the fullness of time came, God sent forth his son, born of woman, born under the law. Just as we were under the law, imprisoned under it, so Christ was born under it. Now look, to redeem those who are under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. Jesus Christ came to rescue us from death, to deliver us from law as master, to have to keep the law, where our life is based on performance. You see, the law drives its adherence based on performance. Here's a set of rules. Do them. If you don't do them, what are you? You're a law breaker. Here's the law. Do it. You don't do it, you're guilty. That's what the law does. It's a performance-driven life, a life under the law. Do all, and you know Christ says, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments, all 613 we're dealing with, you've got to keep them. And here our text in Galatians tells us that Jesus Christ ransomed us from the curse of the law. Why is the law a curse? What's the curse of the law? It's a demand we cannot keep. Remember, the law is good. The law is righteous. The law is the, is the heart of God. The x-ray machine, nobody looks at that x-ray machine and says, you bad x-ray machine, my arm is broken. Oh, it just exposes that your arm is broken. The law is good. So what's the curse of the law? The curse of the law is the fact that it condemns everyone. None can keep it. But Jesus Christ redeemed us from that curse. He paid the price. And what was the price? It was his life. Verse 13, Galatians 3.13, becoming a curse for us. So that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles. Now listen to this. So that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. Because he paid the price of the curse of the law, we are able to be saved simply through faith. Simply by looking upon Jesus. Not by works so that nobody may boast but simply looking upon Jesus and trusting in his completed work on the cross. We're presented with a beautiful freedom. We're no longer under the law. Jesus redeemed us from it. He did what we never could. He kept the law perfectly and he ransomed us. What was the payment? His life. He ransomed us from the curse to having to keep every thing written in the book of the law. And now simply by looking, what does Jesus say in John chapter 3? So as the serpent was lifted up in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that whoever looks upon him will have life. All you've got to do is look. Here the law says, you want to be justified, you want to be holy, do everything. Jesus Christ says, I've saved you from that. Now just look at me. Just have faith. 
and praise the Lord. Brothers and sisters, this is good news. If there's ever good news you're going to hear, it's that you've been redeemed. There's another way to be justified than by adhering to every work of the law. Christ redeemed us from it. But then we have some coming along who say, well, hold on a second. You may be freed from the law in order to get salvation, initially to be saved, but you are not free from the law in your Christian life. Yes, Moses leads us to Jesus to be saved, but then once we're saved, Jesus leads us back to Moses. And now as Christians says, okay, now go back to the law, and now you must adhere to it in your, in your Christianity. But is that what Paul says? Look there in Galatians 3.12. But the law is not of faith. Rather, the one who does them shall live by them. So now that I've been saved, I must go back to the law of Moses and put myself back under the law? No. The law was simply a tutor that led you to Jesus Christ. But now Jesus has ransomed us from the law. We're free from it. A slave does not return to its master once he's been freed, nor do we return to the law as a way of life whereby we must keep it to live. We're under grace, not law, says Paul in Romans chapter 6. He's ransomed us from it. And that's exactly where I want us to turn. Turn with me now to Romans chapter 6. Because then we have a question, or perhaps more like an assertion, from the other side. You see, there's one side who are saying, the law leads us to Jesus, and then Jesus turns right back around and leads us back to the law, saying, okay, now as a Christian you must do, do, do. That's one side. But then we have the other side saying, aha, Jesus Christ has freed us from the bondage and curse of the law, from having to live our lives as performance of keeping the law. Yes, we're, under, we're not under law, but we're under grace. Grace, grace, grace. Let us then do whatever we want, whatever pleases us. That's all covered in grace. No more law. We can do whatever pleases us. Let's just live. We can live in sin, do whatever we want, and grace covers us. No more law. And Paul knows in his teaching, saying we're not under law but under grace, he knows that objection is coming and he answers it. Look in Romans 6, verse 15. What then, now that, we're, now that we're under grace, not under law, what then, are we to sin because we are not under law but under grace? By no means. Absolutely not. Why not? Because of the second ransom price that Jesus paid, he redeemed us from sin. He redeemed us from the law, and he's ransomed us from sin. Look there, verse 16. Paul answers that question of, do we just continue in sin then? He says, absolutely not. Verse 16. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness? But thanks be to God that you were, who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed. And having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. Not only did the law enslave us and trap us under its demands, the reason we could not keep the law is because we had a second slave master. Sin. As Paul says, you are slaves of the one whom you obey. And we all obeyed sin. We all followed the course of the world, living in the passions of the flesh. Look down at verse 17. But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed. And having been set free from sin, become slaves of righteousness. Now notice, we don't have specifically here our word for redeem. We don't have ransom, redemption, redeem. But the concept is explicit in what Paul's saying. Having been set free. This is ransom language. You were bought from sin and now have a new master. Your master is righteousness. Are you to continue in sin? No. That would mean you're still a slave to sin. Now there are two aspects of this redemption from sin 
that Christ accomplished on the cross. So I want us to quickly consider these two aspects of how we were redeemed from sin. And the first is the guilt of sin. The second is the power of sin. So first, consider with me the guilt of sin. And turn with me to Ephesians chapter 1. Sorry, I know I have you turn into some different places today, but we'll get familiar with our Bibles. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 1. We're going to consider our redemption from the guilt of sin. Look there in verse 7. In Him, in Christ, here's our word, we have redemption. Through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of His grace. And he goes on to say some very glorious things. But what I want us to note, we have redemption through His blood blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses. Purchased by Christ's blood was the forgiveness of our sin. This is the legal declaration, not guilty. It's a doctrine we're going to consider in greater depth in coming weeks. It's the doctrine of justification, where we come and stand before God and he declares you not guilty. The former sins in which you've lived, you are not guilty of them any longer. Christ has paid the price for those sins. We're forgiven of our trespasses. That is the guilt of past sin washed away, redeemed through his blood. We have been forgiven. There's no more guilt. So how, what, what does Jesus Christ pay for in relation to sin, to buy us back from sin? He bought us back from the guilt of sin. We, we are no longer guilty. We're no longer living in that. He's redeemed us from it. He's justified us. You're not guilty. But then secondly, he's redeemed us from the power of sin. And that, that has to do with the ongoing reality of sin in our life. Now turn with me now to Titus chapter 2. Shouldn't be too many pages over in your Bible. Titus chapter 2. And we'll consider the redemption from the power of sin. Look at Titus chapter 2 starting in verse 11. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now listen, who gave himself for us to redeem, there's our word, to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. Our captor here in relation to sin was a wicked heart. And Jesus paid the price to replace these wicked hearts with beating, living hearts of flesh that love the Lord and look there, are zealous for good works. The bondage of sin is broken and the believer is set free to live, walking by the Spirit, putting to death the deeds of the body. Look at what he says, verse 14. He gave himself, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people zealous for good works. This is the regeneration of the heart. The old is gone. The new has come. Sin no longer reigns. Here we are, bonded, shackled by the ch chains of sin and death, and Jesus Christ redeemed us from the power of sin. He breaks that power. Sin no longer reigns in our life. Before, when sin controlled you and said, you're going to follow your lusts, you're going to follow your passions, when you get revved up and do... You know, it's, if you ever see... Uh, have you ever seen like a documentary on crime where there's a young man... There's a show I used to watch on one of those, you know, reality discovery uh, investigative shows. And you'd see often, sadly, a young man, 19, 20, 21 years old, who's committed a murder. And now he's caught and faced with the interrogation and the reality that his life is over. 
his life as he knows it is oh, maybe literally death sentence or in jail for the rest of his life. And what do you hear them say? It was a moment of passion. I wasn't thinking. That's not me. It just happened. To, I killed him and that was it. Before Christ, we were ruled by our flesh. We had no control. The passions of our flesh ruled us. We were shackled to our sin. We'd say, I don't want to do these things. I, I wish I could love them more. And we can't because we're ruled by our sin. And Jesus Christ breaks us free from that. Now we walk by the Spirit, putting to death the deeds of the flesh, producing the fruit of the Spirit, which is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And if you've been united to Christ in his work on the cross, your life will produce such fruit. You've been set free from the law that enslaved you, and you've been set free from the guilt and power of sin that shackled you. You're now free to walk by the Spirit in newness of life. Titus 2.14, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify us, to make us a people zealous for good works. That's the second work of redemption. And how and why is any of this possible? I just want to reiterate again, in seeking to exalt Jesus Christ, you were bought with a price. That freedom did not come cheap. Don't turn there, but listen to what Paul says to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 6, 19. He says, do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you whom you have from God? You were not your own. For you were bought, that's our word for redeem. You were bought with a price, so glorify God in your body. Believer, the blood of Jesus Christ has accomplished something for you, something huge, something you could never accomplish. He freed you from your sin. So walk as one freed from sin. Okay, thirdly and finally, we come to our last, last slave master from whom Christ has freed us, and that's the body. Let's consider the body briefly. Though the work of Christ accomplished redemption from sin's reign in the believer's life, sin still remains because of the flesh. We still remain in these weak bodies prone to wander, that feel the pools of temptation all around them? And doesn't this leave us longing and aching, groaning for the day when Christ comes again and redeems these bodies in consummate glory? We sang it earlier. Oh, in those songs, you know how when it, when it crescendos up to the point when it says, and when Christ comes again, we'll behold his face, he'll redeem us, he'll bring us to himself. It's like I can't help the smile coming across my face. How can you not, believer, as you struggle through this life, the reality we saw in Psalm 73, when you think of the redemption of your body, Lord, just get me out of this tent. While we're in this tent, we groan, longing for the redemption of our bodies, the putting on of the imperishable. Oh, we long for our bodies to be redeemed. Listen to Romans 8.23. Listen to Paul. He says, not only creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we eagerly await or as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption. There it is. The ransoming, the paying back, the, the redeeming of our bodies. Now, this aspect of Christ's redemption, we might pause and say, wait a second. I was never perfect. So you said that ransom presupposes a captivity. So you, ransom presupposes I wasn't captive, now I'm captive, now you pay me and get it back again, right? I wouldn't say if you possessed, if Debbie possessed something I wanted, let's say she possessed a basket of fruit and I went and just paid her for it, you wouldn't say, oh, you ransomed the basket of fruit. No, it was never mine. I just bought it. You see that? You see the difference? 
Ransom presupposes freedom, enslavement, and then freedom. It was paid back. That doesn't belong to you. I'm paying it back. Well, our bodies, you might say, but I was never perfect. I never had a perfected body. I'm waiting for consummate glory. But notice this. Jesus Christ created us in a world void of pain and death, void of crying, void of, of agony. The lion and the lamb in the Garden of Eden laid together. There was perfect unity between man and creation. There was no death. And yet sin brought that in. And so when Jesus Christ redeems our bodies in the last day and creates the new heavens and the new earth, it is a paying back. It's a, rece uh, a gaining back of what he had originally had in store. Sin came in and corrupted this world, and sin will not remain in this world. Jesus Christ will pay it back. He will redeem our bodies to how they were meant to be. And so our captor here is our body of flesh. But in that day, these rotting old bodies will be made new. Behold, Paul tells us a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of, the eye, of an eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. For the perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. This Paul here speaking to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 58, 1 to 58, he's saying, listen, in that day, our bodies are going to put on imperishable. Death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? Now notice what he says here in 56. We're in 1 Corinthians 15. You don't have to turn there, but listen. The sting of death is sin. And the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Oh, Paul, what is he... What is he pointing us to? He's pointing us to the redemption of our bodies. In that last day, he's saying, there's going to be no more crying, no more tears. When God comes, you realize in, in the new heavens and the new earth, there's no need for a son. Why? Who's the light? God himself walking among us is the light of the world. In the new heavens and the new earth, perfect unity restored once again with our creator. The sting of death is sin. The blood of Christ has ransomed us from the power of sin. He's accomplished that for you on the cross. And if you're a believer here this morning, he's applied that to you. He's ripped those shackles apart. Now listen to me. If you have not yet been saved, if you have not yet put your trust in Jesus Christ, if you're looking at what Jesus accomplished, he accomplished that in time past and he's offering you this morning saying, come here. Come to me. I'll break those bonds. You can't break them. You've tried. I will because I accomplished it on the cross. And the power of sin is the law. He's saying, look, you're under the law still. You're still stuck. You don't, you've got to keep every single one. James tells us if you've broken the law at one point, you're guilty of it all. But I, re I redeemed you from it. I paid you from that. I'll put you under grace if you will only come to me, do you see what I've accomplished? Let it be applied to you. Oh, and finally, he's saying, this rotting, dead, old corpse, this flesh, which is so drawn to the world, which is so prone to wander, the Lord I love, this flesh that you're captive to, I can save you from that too. I'll redeem you in that day. I'm going to come again and I'm going to restore everything to be as it meant to be. What? Can you think of a greater offer to turn down? What greater news could you hear this morning than to, 
than to hear that everything, every imperfection, every imperfection in your own heart, this incredible law that's bearing down upon you, the redemption of your body to come, I'll, I'll redeem you, I'll pay you back from all of it. What better news could you have? There's nothing more to be offered to you. If you are sitting here this morning, I am pleading with you, do not reject Jesus Christ. Whatever you're holding on to, say, Lord, have it all. I want to, I want to, be, I want to be redeemed from it. You mean, you mean that either I'm going to pay that price or you already paid it? Lord, can I please partake in that? Can I partake in this redemption? Think of it as simply as this. I mean, break it down in your mind. Whatever you need to do to grasp it, think of it as simply as this. I owe $10 million to my slave master. You know, people are slaves. Even today, we live in North America. We don't necessarily get it. 50 years ago, no, not 50, there's, but in this country, 150 years ago, we're not too far removed from slavery. And some slaves actually owe themselves or owe the master a debt. That's why they're a slave. Well, you can't pay it. You're going to be my slave. You work till you pay it off. And guess what these slaves, even today, are faced with? I owe $10 million. And so I'm going to work for this guy to pay it off. But I only make $1.50 a week. You're as good as a slave for the rest of your life. You're really never going to pay it off. You're going to pay with your life. Imagine someone comes to you, slave. The Bible's telling you you're a slave. You're a slave to the law. You're a slave to your sin. And Jesus Christ is saying, I've paid it. Imagine someone comes to you and says, I know your slave master. He's one of my peers. And I know you're working for $1.50 a week and you owe him $10 million. You know you're going to die in this slavery, right? Yeah, I know. You'd be a fool not to. You'd be a fool not to think, I'm going to die here. You'd be a fool to think, I can actually pay this. I can actually bring my good works and pay this. I can actually earn $1.50 a week and pay this. You'd be a fool. So once you've realized the condition you're in, someone comes to you and says, listen, I'll pay him. And you'll be set free. All you got to do is trust me. All you got to do is let me. Well, what do I need to do to earn this? No, no, no. This is a gift for you. Just accept it. And I'll pay him. How, what would you say to a man who turns that down? <laughs> You're a fool, right? There's no rational reason why you turn that down. And I'm pleading with you this morning. Jesus Christ is here saying you're a slave to your sin. No, I'm not. Just think about your thoughts for a moment. Think about the times you've tried to overcome your sin and you can't. You're a slave to your sin. On top of that, you're a slave to the law. Do this and live. You broke it once, you broke it all. And I've paid the price. Just come to me. Just put your trust in me and I'll save you. And here you sit, no matter how old, no matter who you are, will you look at Jesus Christ and say, no, I'll pay it myself. Don't be foolish. Christ paid the price with his life. The one who owes no one anything shed his blood. Remember Psalm 49? The life of a man is too expensive to be paid by any man. No man can ransom the life of a man, but God will ransom. Believer then, how then shall we live? Paul tells us steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, controlled and constrained by the love of Christ, knowing that in the Lord our labor is not in vain. Christian, in light of this reality, live not legalistically under sin, under the law, conforming to a set of rules. Okay, now I've got to really perfect myself by adhering to this. You're under grace. Live as one looking to Christ. 
Live not under the reign of sin. Know your freedom in Christ, Christian. Don't listen to the lie of Satan that says you'll never overcome this. You're free. All you have to do is point to the blood of Christ. We talked about it on Wednesday. How did those, those with whom Satan is waging war, how did they overcome him? By the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. All you've got to do when Satan comes and says, you're stuck in sin, you're never going to overcome that sin. I'll let you overcome this and that. But that one, all you got to do is say the blood of the Lamb. He ransomed me from it. He paid the price. My shackles are free. Christian, don't live under the reign of sin. And live like this body and its pains and its agony is not where you place your hope. Jesus Christ accomplished for us the redemption of our bodies. Don't put your hope and trust in this life. Live in light of your redemption. Well, amen. Father, thank you for your word, Lord. I pray that these truths would grip each and every one of us, save souls, even this morning. In Christ's name, amen.